You are listening to the IFH Podcast Network. For more amazing filmmaking and screenwriting podcasts, just go to ifhpodcastnetwork.com. What is it you want, Barry? What do you want? You, you want the moon? Just say the word and I'll throw a lasso around it and pull it down. You want answers! I want the truth! You can't handle the truth! I see dead people. All I know is that first, you've got to get mad! You've got to say, I'm a human being! God damn it! My life has value! Filmmaking Conversations with Damien Swayde is part of the critical conversations currently taking place across the film community. The podcast reaches out to the next generation of filmmakers who continue to look for inspiration and guidance. Remember to hit the subscribe button and leave a comment in the comments section. Share the podcast with friends and family and have a great day. And now over to the host of the show, Damien Swaby. Evan. Oh, thank you so much for coming on. I mean, it's been years now, I think. It literally has been since, you know, we were supposed to do this, like schedules and everything. Um, you know, luckily for me, I, I came across your film, Son of Clowns, which is absolutely brilliant. Uh, we'll talk about that and everything. But how are you today? How is life in your neck of the woods? I'm doing well, doing well. Coming to you from North Carolina and uh, just trying to make movies outside of the you know hollywood or you know quote unquote professional system and uh you know just trying to enjoy it so it's a process and if you're enjoying it that is good that's the main thing we have to enjoy doing these uh films and projects otherwise it's going to be so much harder for us and hollywood is that something you can see yourself going to in the future do you think Perhaps I, uh, you know, for the longest time, like, you know, I started out uh, with those kind of ambitions and dreams like a lot of filmmakers do. Um, it's it's really only natural because that's what the majority of people when they first start out, that's all, you know, you know, the, the big blockbuster movies, TV shows, that's really where, you know, the general person thinks of movies happening. And so for me, yeah, that was a goal at first. But then I kind of started to realize, you know, it's not so difficult uh, to get your hands on, you know, some basic equipment. It's not the most fancy stuff in the world, but, you know, it gets the job done. Uh, and, you know, you can do a lot of filmmaking wherever you are in the world. And so I figured out uh, pretty young after I went to film school, you know, there are multiple routes to doing this. So, you know, of course, if Hollywood ever comes knocking and they want me to do Star Wars, I'm going to say, absolutely, you know, <laughs> let me let me go for it. I'm not going to turn it down. Um, but, you know, in the meantime, I don't expect that to happen. And I feel OK about that because I've kind of carved out a, a niche where I feel OK making, you know, little storytelling independent type movies that just tell small stories of, you know, three people waiting at a bus stop or, you know, something very simple, but uh, a lot of times very relatable to the everyday person. But how exactly did you get your start in becoming a filmmaker and, and what was that process like for you? Yeah, I started definitely quite young. When I was a kid, uh, I always loved, you know, watching movies, watching television, and I, I loved the storytelling aspect, I think, first and foremost. So for me, it was always about what story can I tell. So, you know, when I was very young, I would borrow or take without permission, so to speak, the, the video camera the family had that was my father's off the shelf and I would play with it and then he'd go back and film something for like a home video and he'd be like, why is there all this random footage of, you know, you doing stuff with your friends or filming the pets and, you know, trees and whatever else. And I think that was me just trying to, you know, establish some sort of narrative. And of course it was super just random at that time, but, you know, it, it was, I think, a building block for sure. And I have plenty of great memories of that um, and then as I got older, you know, I went to, to film school uh, for college here in North Carolina at East Carolina University, studied film. And that's really where I learned, you know, the, the basic rule of thirds, how to edit. And it was great because they kind of taught you a little bit of everything. Um, and at the time, you know, like I said, at the beginning of the show, I really wanted to go into Hollywood. That was my plan. Uh, but what I didn't realize was at the time I was learning how to do, you know, just a little bit of everything. And when the time did come, you know, after graduation, I actually didn't do Hollywood. I started making an independent feature film at age 22, and that was Son of Clowns. And, you know, that was just, uh, it was rough around the edges, but I think it, it taught me that, 
you are allowed to do this filmmaking thing, however difficult, however ragtag, uh, you know, three crew members, whatever it may be, uh, you are allowed to do this outside of Hollywood. And so after that, I kind of realized, okay, wow, there's a whole world that I can create wherever I am. You know, it may be here in North Carolina. Uh, I went to Louisiana for a few years. I made a little independent TV show down there for Amazon. And, you know, that that was fine. And then I came back here to North Carolina because it's where I'm from. I'm very passionate about it. And then I made another independent film uh, for just a couple hundred dollars, which is my latest film, Panda Barrett. And that's funny because to me it was a bit of a you know downgrade in the crew size than the original feature, and to me that was just saying you know it's possible to make a film big or small. You know I think we always think as we grow as a filmmaker, you know everything has to get bigger and bigger and bigger every year, and you can't go back a little bit. But it's okay to go back because sometimes you can tell a story with less resources uh, a little better that way. So I've, I've kind of done it a, a bunch of different ways. <laughs> Well, I must say I'm amazed that Panda Barrett was done for a few, a couple of hundred dollars. You know, the, the look of it and again, the size and scope of your films for an indie project. We spoke about sitting at the bus stop and leafy London or whatever, but you are able to escape from just that small part of indie film and your films grow. They're expansive, but we'll talk about Panda Barrett in a while. Let's get back to Son of Clowns. How did you make that film? And tell us what it's about. Yeah. So Son of Clowns was my first feature. It came out in 2016. We shot it the summer of 2015, which was about a year exactly after I graduated film school. And during that year, I was doing all kinds of, you know, freelance video work, shooting weddings, shooting, you know, corporate videos just to make money, pay the rent. And that was fine. And I remember that whole year I kept waiting. I kept saying, okay, I have this piece of paper. It says graduate of film school. What will that do? And what I didn't realize was that piece of paper really just is more for me to say I have the skills now to do anything in film, but it does not guarantee people to come to you. I realized that in that year of doing all those projects, um, you know, if I want to make it in film, I'm going to have to start writing scripts. I'm going to have to start producing them myself, making them, distributing them. And then, you know, in the case of Son of Clowns, when it was all over, doing it again, maybe five times, you know, so it's not a golden ticket after the first one. Um, so with Son of Clowns, the storyline, I connected very uh, kind of loosely, but also not so loosely to what I was going through that year. Um, it's about a out of work actor who's a little bit str like, you know, struggling, trying to get his foot in the industry. So I kind of based that a little bit of, on my own experiences with film, you know, after graduation, there's that period where you say, OK, what do I do now with my life? What do I do now with film? How do I make it in this industry? And the main character, Hudson and Son of Clowns, was going through that just on the acting side. So it's a little bit meta because it provides a little peek of what film is like as an uh, you know, more of an actor than a filmmaker. But, you know, there's definitely a lot of relatability between the two. So he has to move back in with his parents in North Carolina and uh, join their circus. They run a backyard circus, which is like falling apart. Um, you know, it, it's not very well produced and it's, you know, about to go out of business. So he kind of moves back in to help his parents a little bit. And of course, he's this big actor coming from L.A. who, you know, thinks he knew everything, but, you know, he kind of failed. And so for him, it was a way to reconnect with his roots, but also reconnect with acting, because in the film, he finds ways to do acting uh, in North Carolina. So it's it's a little bit of a, you know, loose bit of truth, but I think it's going to be relatable to anyone who's uh, done anything in the film industry. And I think they'll see some connections. Oh, there were a lot of connections for me personally watching that film. I can say that for sure. Um, we'll get into that later too. But that script for the film, was that one of the first scripts you had written? Because I was really impressed by it. Some of the lines in it, the way they were delivered and everything involved with the film. But you were just 22 when you made that film. How does a 22-year-old come up with a script like that? Uh, I don't know. I... um. I guess that I think for me that year and, and I know a year doesn't sound like a lot of time, but I think that year between college and making Son of Clowns was was pivotal in shaping the script. I mean, obviously, I, I wrote the script during that year. 
Um, and I, I really took my time with the, you know, I really wrote it for about eight months, uh, between graduation and day one of production on Son of Clown. So, you know, there was a lot of time to write. There was a lot of time to think, um, you know, there's a lot of like life truth and philosophy and stuff that I think, uh, you know, especially with substance uh, and, and struggles and kind of some more darker stuff and also some funny stuff. Um, I took some of that just from people I knew, people I'd had experiences with, uh, you know, things I've read about, a little bit of philosophy, um, you know, movies I've seen even. And a lot of it, I think, came from the struggle of the film industry and just kind of seeing how hard it was to get into things and to to market yourself and to be successful. And I think that's like, you know, as, as someone in their early 20s, uh, you know, I'm, I'm closer to 30 now, but, you know, it, the I think that's a very unique time in one's life where they're trying to, you know, put themselves into the quote unquote adult world. And, uh, you know, how do I become a real person? And I think there's a lot of that uh, kind of struggle and angst in there. And I think it's relatable just because it is something everyone has to go through, you know, in some way, shape or form, you know, no matter where you are in the world. It certainly does. I mean, some of the lines you you had written out, your pain binds us no matter what. And so many people who love acting, as, so sorry, it was, I'm, I'm, I'm messing up the lines here, but one of them was along the lines of so, so many people who love acting, but they only love it as a meal ticket for something else. I mean, even at the age of 22, you, you knew that. I mean, what experiences did you have that were that made you write lines like that? Yeah, I think it was seeing just a little bit of the the underbelly of the film festivals and the film industry. Um, and, you know, and I had ha only had a peak, you know, I, I did some production assistant work uh, during that year as well as like the freelance wedding video. I mean, I did anything I could to pay the rent and just make money and um, you know how it is, the struggle. Oh, tell and, me about it. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and I, but I do think some of that was, was beneficial in hindsight because at the time while it was difficult, um, you know, I would go on these, uh, like reality shows. There were a lot of these reality shows that were doing stuff. Like I did an episode of shark tank that was doing a bunch of, um, you know, auditions in North Carolina. And, you know, they were just like, I don't even think they aired much of that, uh, process in the actual episodes, but, you know, while they're looking for people in casting, you're watching just, you know, hundreds of people come through these judges and this and that and this and that. And, you know, I was just doing production assistant, you know, getting coffee, moving cables and stuff like that. Uh, but I just saw these hundreds of people coming through and, 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 you know, such passion with each of them, but you could also tell, you know, some folks were not in it for the product. They were pitching, they're in it for the, you know, the fame or this or that. And, you know, you'd have the people who'd come and, you know, do something outlandish because it would get attention. Um, and that kind of took away from what the actual, you know, message was. So, you know, there was a lot of that. And I think just also a lot of the, you know, the, the frustrations with the hierarchy of film and the film set, you know, a lot of it is like, you know, maybe you should treat your production assistants, you know, with some kindness and some decency. I know that, you know, that's just quote unquote getting coffee, but you know, the way I like to run my film sets is I've been the production assistant. So now that I'm directing and stuff, you know, I want to make sure the production assistants are, you know, having fun. Like, are they happy? You know, I don't want them to just think they're they're there to do one thing. You know, I want them to feel like they're a part of the crew. And of course, you know, I, I do respect the, you know, hierarchy of the director's vision and, you know, trying to get things done. You know, it's never at the expense of the film. But I do think there's a way to, you know, walk and chew gum at the same time and make sure you're getting things done in an efficient manner um, while also, you know, extending, you know, a little bit of kindness to people. Um, so, yeah, I think that's just a, a weird combination of how a lot of that uh, psychologically, you know, whether I realized it at the time or not, uh, made its way into the movie. So. so you had a ton of coverage in that film. I was amazed even by the opening credits in the car. It's driving. I'm seeing shot after shot after shot. How many members of crew did you have for that production? Yeah. So for Son of Clowns, it was pretty lean. There were not a lot of people. Um, there were probably on on our largest production day, maybe eight to 10 people in the whole crew. And there were days where, you know, some people had to work and some people couldn't make it. So, you know, there was one day our audio uh, tech couldn't make it. 
It was like a last minute thing. And so I was like, oh no, you know, I had already driven an hour and a half uh, to the location and, you know, I was trying to scramble and figure it out. And luckily someone stepped in and then it happened again a few days later and I didn't have someone to step in. So I actually directed and ran audio on our third day of production and, you know, it it, it worked like and I'm glad that I went to that, uh, you know, film school I was talking about earlier and I was able to understand just enough to run audio. You know, I'm not going to say I'm a professional audio tech. I would much rather work with someone else who has a passion for that. Um, But, you know, I know enough to get it done in a pinch. And I think it was helpful to have that skill set in my back pocket. And luckily, that was the only time it happened. But yeah, I mean, that day we had uh, just me, my producer and my cinematographer. So it was three people that day. Amazing. That is really, really good. And the actors themselves in the film, I mean, your two leading actors, I thought were absolutely brilliant. The chemistry between them is something that I thought was completely well directed because for time and, and sometimes situations don't allow directors to maybe direct and get certain performances out of certain actors but those two actors in particular where did you find them and what was your experience like working with them yeah uh so the interesting thing like you mentioned with indie film is that a lot of it is just who you know connections uh open casting calls you know so a lot of it was uh just me putting out a casting call saying, you know, hey, are there actors in North Carolina who want to do a movie? I mean, you know, we'd had no budget for payment. So it was just on the premise of getting, you know, footage for your reel. Um, And obviously, you know, we tried to feed people and do all that. But, you know, I wasn't sure who would apply. And, you know, luckily we had people apply and like all the actors in the film who did end up there, they did an outstanding job, I think. And, uh, you know, it's funny, like you mentioned with finding the time to direct, like, in those positions where, you know, I was having to double up and run sound and, uh, you know, move a light or something like you, you worry that, oh no, this is going to take away time with my actors, you know? And, and that's something I'm always cognizant of as a director because my first and foremost priority is, is the actors. That's how I like to work. I want to make sure, um, you know, they feel like they're getting attention that they need to get their lines right to make sure, you know, we're not moving too fast, uh, you know, cause sometimes it takes a few takes to get people warmed up and comfortable. Um, so I, so I do think that was something that was always in my mind when I was making, you know, son of clowns and really all the film sense. And, uh, you know, I think I did luck out because the cast was very, uh, you know, willing to work at a great speed because there were a lot of times where we did have to go fast and they really just, you know, made sure we got it done. You know, we had a little bit of rehearsal time, but honestly not much. And that's something I've tried to incorporate more in my subsequent films is, you know, making sure we had a little more time to rehearse because that way, you know, in case you do have to move very quickly in your production, um, you know, a lot of times you only have like six hours to shoot in a location and then you have to leave because they need to kick you out. <laughs> so, you know, a lot of times if you do the uh, kind of rehearsals and pre-production, then some of that will carry over on the day of and you won't have to, you know, rush quite as much because your actors will be a little more comfortable. But but yeah, in the case of Son of Clowns, I definitely lucked out with the cast. And some of the people in the film, am I, I'm taking a wild guess just because of the nature of indie film, were they not actors yeah there were a couple people who um were just you know people a couple people i knew no not many of the many of the folks who had like the leading leading roles yeah. uh but there were a couple yeah. like quick roles you know people just you know friends and uh you know community yeah. members and thought yes and, yeah I, I thought and the main reason why i asked is because i felt that was handled you know really well as well because i've been in those experiences myself and i've watched other films when people have their friends in and it just kind of it kind of feels flat um it, it doesn't quite work but i think it's really good if you're able to fill those roles with friends and still pull it off it's you know it's the sign of great directing and certain scenes in that film which which really touched on the emotional state of actors when things are not going the way they would like them to go. Some turn to certain things. Your lead character turned to alcohol. What led you to write about that in the way you did? Yeah, absolutely. I think the it, it comes back to a lot of what I 
witnessed and observed when I was kind of looking at the, you know, like I said, underbelly of a lot of these uh, creative endeavors, not just in film. You know, I did some work with, uh, you know, I did a lot of music videos. I've met a lot of musicians in a multitude of genres, and I've seen a little bit of that there. And, you know, it's it's kind of the type of thing where, you know, also it's some personal experience of people I know. And, you know, that's the thing with writing. I can't say Son of Clowns is a perfect one-to-one depiction of any one person or any one experience in my life but it's a combination of a lot of different things and a lot of small moments and different people kind of fusing themselves into Hudson who is the main character and I think that was just sort of a vehicle to express you know more clearly a lot of the struggle and a lot of that you know turning to a substance of any kind and what that does to a person and kind of how it changes them and a lot of times how it distracts them from what their original goal was that kind of led them down that path and so uh son of clowns yeah that was that was the the interesting thing about it was it was kind of um i, I won't say funny because there's nothing funny about you know the dark stuff but i but I do understand that, you know, like real life, there are dark moments that can have a small bit of humor or there are moments that are supposed to be funny, very but are true. actually very sad, you know, that are very um, unfortunate to look at. So I kind of tried to blend a little bit of those together because I think that the the line between comedy and, you know, sorrow and, and seriousness, sometimes it's not as far as people think. Very, very true. It, it was sad to see, but it was something that jumped out because I've seen it with so many people and, and creatives, um, just as the way you put it. And the, the house itself, the house where your, the lead character lived in, sorry, uh, with his family. How did you get that house? Because I just thought everything looked so well. It didn't. It it looked like you may have had an art director. I don't know if you did or you didn't, um, but it looked really really well for an indie film where a lot of the times you can it feels like someone's had to use a house because it's the only house on offer right yes and i very much understand when there's the only house on offer because i have had to do that (laughs) many times and um that house interestingly enough actually was the house uh that uh the dad and mom who are you know an actual couple in real life they're actors and great friends of mine uh eric and april hartley they that was their house and uh they just we we needed a house and they actually had a lot of the uh you know kind of whimsical stuff like the clown stuff and a lot of the costuming they actually collect a lot of costumes and stuff like that so it worked out that they had some of that um they didn't have everything so you know the rest of it like the the giant giraffe head um sculpture out of paper mache that we had a local artist that they knew bring that in um, and he did an outstanding job making that and let us borrow it just for the production. Um, and then, you know, like a lot of the clown, you know, portraits and things on the wall in the house I actually just went to thrift stores in my area for like three or four months before production and just rummaged through a lot of what they had. And, you know, I'd buy these like weird <laughs> clown paintings and stuff. I don't know why people had them, but, you know, I got a couple of them and I really only spent like $10 on them. Um, so it was just a combination of the stuff they had and a lot of the, you know, thrift stores. And uh, we collaborated with one artist locally, which helped a lot too. Um, but it was just a lot of resource based filmmaking. And the actual circus, did your friends, did they have that circus that they used in their, their backyard? Yeah, that was that was the one thing that we definitely created from scratch. What was funny about that circus scene was it was the second to last day of production. I was exhausted. Um, I actually there's a behind the scenes son of clowns. You know, I won't call it a full documentary, but just just a bunch of clips from behind the scenes. I sort of compiled into a video on my YouTube channel, and you can go watch that. And there's moments where. I'm like ripping a few pages out of the script because the sun was setting too quickly and it was the summer in North Carolina too. And so it was like a hundred degrees that day. It was so hot. We were all sweating. Um, I think I drank like three gallons of water that day in about four hours. Like it, it was like one of the hardest production days I've ever had to experience in my entire filmmaking career. Um, and then in addition to all of that, we had about 20 extras who were children running around screaming, 
playing with you know toys and jumping on little trampolines for the scene because it was supposed to be a birthday party and you know i didn't have an assistant director so my producer kind of helped wrangle the extras um but there were you know like 20 kids 10 parents there for this you know child birthday party scene with the circus you know had the actors in clown makeup their makeup was sweating off because it was so hot um, it was it's just you know so many things happening at once it was very overwhelming um and, you know, not to mention we were running low on time. And so, yeah, that was all just very quickly pulled together. And I'm actually amazed that it worked out at all because <laughs> like all the stuff we decorated it with was, you know, some of the things that the uh, the actors I mentioned earlier, April and Eric had. But a lot of it was stuff. Again, I just found it like the thrift shop. Um, I went to like the hard store and bought just a bunch of like, you know, cheap children's uh, birthday party, you know, tablecloths and, you know, plates and stuff like that. <laughs> so it was it was very low budget, but it but it worked because that was sort of the premise of the circus, you know. And any particular theory or how do I say a any type of technical language you may have learned that provided you the skills to write that film? I mean, like there's the free chapter rule and, and things like that. What, what, did, what did you learn beforehand that may have helped your skills and your ability to write that film? I think one of the major parts was try, you know, with the exception of that circus scene I mentioned, I, I tried to keep everything in that film uh very lean i didn't you know write any spaceships or aliens or lasers yeah. you know no nothing like that um the circus scene was the hardest thing we had to do and i think if i were to do another film you know i'd probably not try unless i you know just had to do a scene with that many extras um unless i just had a bunch more crew to help me because it was very difficult doing that with you know three people on the crew you know four people on the crew that day and uh you know we made it happen but i think that was sort of the biggest thing was uh trying to, to lean on the heartfelt moments you know between the two leads between the parents between the family um you know there's there's a lot of like you know weird eye-catching things you know with the clowns and the circus in the film but i think the heart of the film is not so much that i think it's more of the the relationship drama the the family dynamics um you know, I think the family is, is strangely the, you know, the, the men, I haven't watched the film in several years since it came out, but the, the part I think about all the time, especially with, you know, some time to process the film after releasing it is the, the scenes towards the end with the family. Cause I think it's sort of the thing he neglects for most of the film. He kind of takes them for granted until the end and something happens, which I won't spoil. And then he kind of has to face his family and his family, which, you know, have always been this sort of background thing, really come to the foreground. And, and I think the actors who played the family in that scene did an outstanding job. Um, but I think it shows that you can't ignore anything for too long because it always comes back around. That's a great point. That is a very, very good point of you to say that. So how many days exactly did it take to shoot? Yeah. Uh, we shot the Son of Clowns, believe it or not, in about 10 production days. And it wow. blows my mind that we were able to pull it off uh, to this day. And, you know, we had one day of pickups, which is where we did the majority of the, uh, you know, shots without the actors, you know, him driving the car at the beginning and the intro. Um, that's just a bunch of shots of Raleigh and the highway and stuff like that of him traveling that was just because you know i'm from raleigh north carolina that's my hometown and i wanted to really show the city off um in the film and just kind of add it to the texture of the narrative and um yeah that's funny because that whole day was uh one of our uh, gaffers and production assistants driving a car, my cinematographer riding. And then that was actually me driving the car. That was my car at the time. So, it, you know, I put a lot of myself in the film, uh, even if it was subtle like that. Um, yeah. But yeah, it's just funny. Like most of this film was done in about, gosh, like two weeks of time, but it felt like such a isolate. It almost felt like a time capsule compared to the rest of that summer because i mean you know we shot it in a summer and uh two weeks and it, and it felt like going to like a summer camp you know wow that's that's out of this world i thought you was gonna say quite a few more days but if you can do it in 10 you know i take my hat off to you well done and the post-production for the film how did that go and how long did that take 
So the post-production was very interesting um, because at the time, this was in 2015, I was working, you know, like I said, on all these other uh, productions for, you know, freelance and I was directing music videos and corporate commercials and stuff like that. Um, and then I went and moved a couple, like a month and a half after we made Son of Clowns, I moved to Baton Rouge, Louisiana, and I started a job at a production agency and was, you know, doing cinematography and directing with commercial work. And, you know, that was like a full time job. And so I was working at night editing for about almost a year. And it was usually just this like thing I would do when I got home from work. And there were days where like I was not doing the best, uh, you know, time management because you know, I'd be editing all day at work, coming home and doing more editing for my own film. And by the end of the day, my eyeballs literally felt like they were about to fall out. So I was just staring, staring at, you know, monitors and screens and Adobe Premiere and just all these things all day. And, you know, I think now I found better ways to balance time. But the biggest reason I did it, uh, you know, so quickly over the course of uh about a year, you know, I think post-production, it started in August and it was just me. You know, I did all, all the post-production because I didn't have money to hire anyone else. Um, I do enjoy editing. And like I mentioned, I do it for work. So for me, it's not foreign. It's, you know, it feels very natural. Um, and, you know, what I love about editing is you have all the time in the world in a way. You know, it's not like on set where you have to be out of the location in six hours. You can, you can edit one scene a hundred different ways. And, you know, a yes. lot of times... It, you know, it feels like there's too much time because uh, it feels like there's almost too much freedom to do anything. And I do think, uh, you know, at a certain point you have to get other eyeballs on it. So I was very lucky to, you know, after a few months, I was able to show it to some, you know, the crew and then, you know, some, you know, friends in the filmmaking industry. And honestly, some people who had nothing to do with film just because I wanted to get a variety of perspectives just so people could tell me you know, what's working and what, what's not working. And, you know, the original cut was way too long. It was like two hours and people wow. told me, yeah, you need, you need to pull some air out of this. So, you know, we pulled about 30 minutes of footage out of the film. Um, and, you know, it's unfortunate because you think to yourself, man, if I knew that uh, we could have shaved one or two production days off of the whole thing, but <laughs> hindsight is twenty twenty. It is, it is indeed. It is. So how did you feel with all the experience under your belt? when it came to making Panda Barrett? So when I made Panda Barrett, that was last year. So we're fast forwarding now from Son of Clowns about four years. So, you know, I've done, like I said, a bunch of commercial work, music video work. Uh, I made an independent TV series while I was in Louisiana. And then I moved back to North Carolina to do more work here just because it's home. And since I've been back, you know, I took about two years to do it, you know, a couple shorts, a couple of projects. But I really wanted to do that next feature. And I wanted it to be different from Son of Clowns. And, uh, you know, I think, like you said, that experience from Son of Clowns, you know, ranging from the production the post-production um and especially like the film festivals like we took son of clowns on the film festival circuit for majority of 2016 and you know we we screened uh all over the country we screened a couple international film festivals and it was it was a great learning experience because you know some film festivals were great um some were not so great because you know we we didn't it didn't always justify going, you know, if you fly somewhere and you spend the money in a hotel, I mean, I'm sure you know about this. It's, yes. it's sometimes it's hard because it. you, yeah, it's always not worth it. And, you know, I've done screenings with son of clowns where, you know, we had three people in the oh, audience no. and I'm I had, so sorry uh, to hear that. Oh no, it's normal. It's, it's part of filmmaking. And I think it's, you know, I, I would hope I could avoid the, you know, experience, of, you know, traveling across the country for that because I did that. But there were other film festivals I traveled across the country for and we had 150 people. So okay. a lot of it came down to the film festival. You know, did the film festival just want my money or did they want to actually promote the film and engage a community with the film? You know what I'm saying? It, it's sort of that kind of experience. Um, so now luckily I'm able to kind of sniff out what film festivals are worth it but you kind of have to go through that at first sometimes, unfortunately. Um, but yeah, coming back to the question with Panda Barrett, I think it was just a combination of all those things. And I knew that 
Um, with this film, you know, I wanted to make something that would stand out to audiences that would be a little shorter than an hour and a half. So, you know, Panda Bear, it's only an hour and three minutes. Um, we are releasing it later this year and I can't wait for people to see it. And, uh, you know, obviously the, the COVID situation has made it more complicated than we could have ever anticipated just because, you know, yes, there are film festivals now, uh, you know, doing virtual screenings, but a lot of the point of going to a film festival is networking, maybe meeting a distributor. Um, and, you know, some of that can happen over Zoom and over Skype and stuff like that. But will it be the same? I don't know. So we've we've had to pivot a lot of our uh, strategy um, with Panda Barrett. But I, I do think, uh, funny enough, even with all that being said, and I know that's just a mouthful of just random technical release stuff. I don't know how interesting that is. Oh, but I think if you're... Everyone yeah. Can hear that. Yeah, I was going to say if you're if you're an independent filmmaker, uh, sometimes that's the most interesting part is like, how do you get it seen um, when the film festivals are done? And then it's just you and the film again. How do you what do you do now? And so, you know, it's the type of thing where, you know, I'm lucky enough to be able to put it on Amazon. So it will be coming to Amazon later this year. But even beyond Amazon, that's not enough because, you know, you can put it out there. But there's so many movies, you know, how do you even get it seen in that large sea of movies so a lot of it comes down to wow okay so the in the years of independent filmmaking and the years of trying to get you know attention and distribution and just kind of connect with an audience that's proving very crucial right now in the age of covid because uh it's all that matters. It's the only thing you can do is what you can do from your own, you know, home, so to speak. And so I think if you're able to connect with an audience, um, that's why I do a lot of like YouTube videos of behind the scenes, just because I think people connect to that. Um, and I show the process because, you know, a lot of people say, why would you show the process? Well, I think that's the the most interesting part a lot of times, especially to, you know, actors and filmmakers. So very, very true. But tell us what exactly is Panda Bear it's all about? Yes. Uh, so Panda Barrett is a very surreal feature, a very short feature film that I made last year with a local rapper here in North Carolina, Camus Leonardo. And we were originally talking about making a music video. And I don't even know how it got brought up at the time, but we were saying, wouldn't it be funny if there was a panda bear in the music video? And we kind of left it at that. And, you know, we, you know, he sent me a song for the music video. It was kind of going to be just a surreal kind of trippy concept. Um, and then at a certain point, I, I thought to myself, I was like, you know, this concept of this music video, it's great, but I feel like there's a actual narrative with the panda and with you. Uh, I was talking to Camus and I was like, with you and the panda. And he was like, oh, really? I was like, yeah. Like, what would you think if I like wrote a script and just sent it to you? Would Would you feel comfortable like acting, you know, not just doing the music video, but, you know, actually acting and talking and doing all that. He's like, yeah, just send me a script. So I took a few months. I wrote a whole feature script. I sent it to him and he was like, let's do it hundred percent in. And I was very lucky to have, you know, a fellow creative uh, who comes from the music industry. So he has a, you know, an entirely different viewpoint on creative things that I can't even see sometimes. So it was very fun to be able to kind of meld the two, you know, visual and, and music together. And, you know, he wrote some original music for the film and it kind of just branched off and got bigger from there. Uh, but the actual story of the film, the plot is about a fictional version of himself dealing with the grief and dealing with the loss of his girlfriend and kind of what does he do now in life now that the person he loves most is gone. So that's where we start the film with him alone. And, you know, he's living life and then he's seeing this kind of almost imaginary friend in the form of a panda bear with a mascot costume and no one else can see it. <laughs> so it's a surreal adventure with that. And, you know, we have a lot of fun. There's a lot of jokes. Um, but the film is, again, sort of like Son of Clowns in the way that, uh, you know, it deals with a dark subject with maybe some humor sometimes. Um but yeah, the, the film is definitely a roller coaster just in that short hour. Yeah. Camus, the character, I mean, he goes through about every emotion in the book. So it's amazing that what you've just told me because I presumed he was an actor. I mean, sometimes I, I don't mean in a I don't mean this in a horrible way at all, but there are sometimes I see act, uh, rappers who's who act and it, it, it might be clear that they're musicians rather than actors. 
but I, I think he done a really great job. Um, that's really, really interesting to hear. And I'm happy that you were able to connect with someone who has a broader vision, uh, that he could take it on board, that you wanted to make a film. And, and, and it's such a, a kind of zany, cool film as well. Like when the, the panda appears, because I watched it myself today, I... It was just out there. Do you, do you get what I mean? It's uh, it, it's compelling. You just want to know what's going to happen. Why is this panda here? And I didn't realise until maybe I'm a bit silly until a bit further on that. Oh, no one knows there's a panda here. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, so, and I love that. I love that. And, and actually, it's interesting uh, hearing you say that. Like I'm reacting to this live because you know, there's only like 10 or 15 people in the world who've seen this film right now. And, you know, obviously it will come out soon on Amazon and more people will see it. Uh, but, you know, without the film festivals as much, you know, I haven't been able to do obviously test screenings. So it's it's interesting to hear you say that because a few of the other folks I've talked to who've seen the film as well have said the same thing. And it, it's okay. always interesting hearing other audience members react to that because, you know, as the filmmaker, you think, oh, yeah, you know, people have to think this way, you know, they, they're going to know immediately. But a lot of times you forget that you wrote it. So you have, you know, knowledge that is, you know, unique to you as the writer. So that's that's really interesting. I'm actually glad to hear that. That's that's fascinating. What's it like directing a musician? Because he had a, a great reserved um, performance. It's like he was aware of where the camera was what shot was being taken and where to place his voice. Did that come naturally or was that something you were developing alongside him? Camus is very natural and I, and I love that about him because he, I mean, he blew me away. I mean, he blew a lot of the actors away. I mean, I know he's the lead in the film, so I'm going to talk him up. And, you know, I, I think he just did an outstanding job. Like, and I truly mean that because, you know, like you said, it's you never know what you're going to get when you work with someone who is not uh, you know, a quote unquote professional actor, but I think anyone can act. I think a lot of times we look at that word act and we say, okay, well, you know, if you're taking your friend who, you know, just does their thing, maybe they make music, maybe they work an office job and you tell them now you have to pretend to be, you know, James Bond, they're going to say, okay, what do I do with that? I have no experience for that, that I can't relate to that. But with Camus, a lot of this film, he told me, was very close to his real life. So for him, he said a lot of it never felt much like acting. You know, the stuff with the panda bear obviously is outlandish, but like the the emotional scenes and the, you know, writing music and kind of reacting to things. Because, um, you know, he was channeling a lot of his own personal grief and loss with, uh, you know, different things that had happened in his life. And he was putting that into a lot of the way that the character Camus was acting to the loss of his girlfriend in the film. And so, you know, he was able to really draw on emotions that, that really just blew me away as a director. And obviously, you know, we worked together on some rehearsals, but yeah, I was just so impressed with what he did on those days of production. And I've told him, I'm like, man, I, I hope you act more. Like, I want to do more films, but I hope that you do more acting because you really do have a gift for it. One shot in particular that comes to mind is the shot when you panned right down as the actor, your lead actor, came through the door. How did you do that shot with minimal equipment? Because it didn't feel like the type of shot taken by a director who didn't want to see themselves as a cinematographer in the film. Yeah, so this film was fascinating. Uh, like I mentioned earlier, I've done a lot of cinematography for work. So for me, it's nothing... I'm scared of technically, um, you know, I'm not the best cinematographer in the world, but technically I, I'm proficient enough to get it done. So I was never scared of the camera and the tech or anything like that. My biggest fear was just dividing the time between my actors. You know, I didn't want to take away uh, any minutes that could be spent with them, kind of like we mentioned earlier. Um, and so I think that was kind of my biggest thing. And also I knew the way I usually shoot, um, you know, I've done some documentary work as well. Uh, and even Son of Clowns, I wasn't the cinematographer, but we shot basically everything handheld. And for this film, there's a little bit of handheld, but the majority of it was on sticks on the tripod. Uh, and, and I wanted to do that intentionally just because I wanted the film to feel uh, very stagnant at the beginning, just for the way the, ca the character Camus was feeling stagnant and just very 
stuck sometimes. You know, I didn't want there to be all that freedom of movement, um, at least until later. And uh, so, yeah, it was interesting because you would think sometimes, okay, well, shooting on tripod, that's great. That that you don't even have to hold the camera. But a lot of times it takes longer because you're having to, you know, adjust things, make sure it's level, make sure everything works perfectly. And I mean, that shot with the pan coming around the door, uh, I mean, that was that was me trying to put just a semblance of movement just to try and give him a little bit of, uh, you know, momentum just because at the beginning it is so much static shot, static shot, static shot. And that was one of the, the earlier times where we're actually getting a pan or just a little bit of movement to show him slowly kind of making his journey out of being stuck. Um, and that was another thing was I was trying to match the cinematography to the writing. So the scenes where he starts to come alive again and start to get better, you know, I won't spoil the ending or anything, but, you know, I tried to make those match a little bit and kind of pull the cinematography uh, off the sticks for those. You certainly did. And can you see yourself being the cinematographer on your next film? I won't say I won't, <laughs> you know, <laughs> I, I, I think I won't say I will either, but what I love about this experience with Panda Barrett um, was that now I can say I've shot a feature film and, and even if I never do it again, I feel that I always have the opportunity to, if an emergency happened, if, you know, like I said, uh, you know, a cinematographer has to cancel or something, you know, they're not available. I can't use that as an excuse. So I love not having excuses because I think, you know, in the past, if the cinematographer pulled out or, you know, something happened, I would say, well, too bad. I guess we have to wait till next year or whatever happens. But now I, I can't say that. I can't make that excuse. So I kind of love it because it helps keep me accountable uh, for my own work. It does. And the great thing is you stepped in for audio purposes. You're a writer, you're a director, you're a producer. You've got it all and you're ready to go. Yeah, it's funny because I, I, I don't aim to have it all either, if that makes sense. Like, I would always prefer to work with the crew. Um, but I also understand that in the world of independent filmmaking, um, especially out here in North Carolina, like, I'm not always going to be given that luxury um, or at least given that luxury with the smaller budgets I tend to work with. And that's OK. You know, I think it's empowering to be able to do it yourself um, and to learn from others when you are around them so that maybe later you can do it yourself. I, I think I learned a lot from uh, my cinematographer on Son of Clowns. I learned a lot from other cinematographers I've worked with. And I think, you know, years of, of watching that, even just working, uh, was helpful and crucial and able uh, and, you know, enabling me to kind of touch that camera and, you know, push the buttons and make it happen. So two of the themes in the film that came to mind in both of the films, sorry, is that the man needs the love of a woman or a man needs the love of a woman when he's fallen on hard times. Why do you think those themes came up in the film? That's really interesting. Yeah, I think it's love in general, too. I think it's love from family, love from a woman, love from uh, whoever you love, you know, man or woman uh, or anyone. You know, I think it's just love. I think truly that is the the theme of these movies. I think, uh, you know, there's always like drama, of course, that's interesting, right, when you're looking at a relationship of any kind. But I think isolation is not human nature. And, you know, like I said, in the in the age of COVID, I think that's especially interesting right now. Um, but that's always sort of been my, you know, come around line again with my films. I, I think there are a lot of people, my main characters tend to be isolated. They They tend to be a little bit lost. They tend to not fully engage or want to engage with the world around them um and you know i'm pretty introverted as a person i you know i i think i channel some of that honestly from myself and i think a lot of times you know there's a tendency to think okay well we can do things alone we can do things like this 
but it's truly with the community or with the loved one or with a love of your life or with anyone who shows you compassion and kindness and reminds you, uh, you know, that you're not alone in this world, even if you think you are. Um, and I think that love can show many forms. I think there's, you know, minor characters too in the script who show Camus uh, a type of love, you know, maybe it's not romantic, um, maybe it's tough love. You know, there's the the scene in the middle with a bunch of the um, folks he meets out in the woods. And I won't spoil the scenes because the movies are not out. But, you know, those those people show him a tough love of sort of, you know, even though it doesn't appear like love, you know, they're they're kind of messing with him and showing him a lot of uh, negative things at first. But they're they're also saying, like, you are choosing to put yourself in this situation right now. And you are, you know, fortunate enough not have not to have to like, you know, be homeless or live out in the woods or whatever. And that was kind of the, the lesson there for him. Um, so I think at a certain point, being isolated sometimes distorts your own reality to the point where you put yourself in situations uh, that aren't the smartest or aren't the best for you. You know, even with like Son of Clowns and the uh, reliance on the main character with alcohol, I think that's kind of an example of, you know, feeling like you're alone. But then you look at him and you're like, okay, well, you actually have a whole family. You're just choosing not to engage with them. Um, and, and unfortunately, like a lot of times that's what happens. Like People forget what they have right in front of their eyes. That's excellent. I mean, I've never thought about it like that before. So I'm going to make myself sound intelligent and copy what you said. <laughs> but um, <laughs> in all seriousness, um, I know one or two people who are living in isolation but they might need to think about how and why they are living in isolation and what things they could do to improve their situation regardless of COVID-19 or anything else for that matter. Yeah and I mean isolation is is funny because you know you you can see people who are choosing to cut themselves off from other people uh and, you know, a lot of times there's a lot of pain behind that decision. It's not personal. It's, you know, they're they're going through something. Um, and so, you know, you have to approach it with love, with that, sh that same type of love that I think they're yearning for, but they may not ever say publicly. Um, I think you have to kind of show that compassion that they're missing. And uh, I think a lot of times if we could all just be more vulnerable with each other, I think a lot of these types of isolation probably wouldn't exist in the way that they do but i think it's because people are so you know oh i just have to go through it myself i'll figure it out i don't need help you know that kind of mentality i think that's what breeds a lot of this isolation very true indeed and in the future what can we expect to see from you yeah um i think more films that that deal with this type of uh emotionality you know i think that there's a lot more I could say to it, and I think future films will talk about it. Um, I, I like the concepts of people trying to do hard things in everyday circumstances. So, you know, it's it's not Luke Skywalker trying to save the the galaxy. Uh, you know, I love that, but it's one person trying to save their family member, or one person trying to step up and be a better father or a better friend. Um, and I think that's the type of story that we need in the world because I think it's much more relatable and I think that it has more application in everyday life uh, than saving the galaxy because, you know, how, how does one person do that? <laughs> I'm completely with you. And thanks so much for coming on the show. I'm going to put your links in the show notes so everybody can go and watch your work, follow you on Twitter and everything like that. And I definitely hope to speak to you again. Thanks so much for coming by. Thanks. Appreciate it.